So sticking with this theme of tag, uh, we, all, we all know how to play tag, right? It's really universal, and really I think that it should probably be an Olympic sport. I really do. I mean, we have, we have synchronized swimming, and we have trampoline, honestly. People get gold medals for doing these things. So why not tag is all I'm saying. I think it should get a chance. I have no idea how they're going to score that or give first, second, and third. I don't know. But the point is getting away from us, okay? <laughs> but as we're talking about tag the past few weeks, the main point has been that, the, that when you reach out and tag somebody or, or you affect another person's life, for instance, that they, now having gained the momentum, will be inspired to do the same thing and tag somebody else. When you tag your neighbor by serving them, oftentimes they're inspired to go and serve somebody else. When you love others, they're inspired to love others in the same way that you modeled them. Now, if we apply that thinking to small groups, it really comes down to sharing your life with select individuals and inspiring them to go on and do the very same thing with other individuals. So what is a small group? Just so we have a working definition this morning. This is what a small group is, okay? It is it's a group of around 10 people that intentionally meet together over a period of time that pray together, do life together, and study the Word of God together. That is a small group. And when I think a small group, I always think of the word intimacy. A small group is a group of individuals that, that you can divulge your life's junk to, and you can be met with care, understanding, and love. That's a small group. It's a place where you can grow in three key relationships. Those, those relationships are this. You're going to grow with God, you're going to grow with believers, and you're going to be encouraged and grow in your relationships with unbelievers. Look, guys, here's the truth, okay? If you don't have Christians that are sharing your life with you, then you are not growing in any of these three areas. You're not. And I mean this is true even if you have a faithful record of attending service on Sundays. You're not growing in these three areas. Because, guys, as Pastor Brett was alluding to, if we're honest, how much connection time do we actually get every Sunday with Christians when we come into this building? Honestly assess that. How much connection do we have? You know, we could do church just like this the rest of our lives, and we, would, we could fail at connecting with anybody. We would completely fail at connecting with each other. And, and connection is the very reason that we come into these doors every week, isn't it? We want to connect with people. The truth is that we can worship God on our own. We can do that outside of here. We don't need a church building to do that. We can all download podcasts of sermons. We can download worship music. We don't really need to come to church for that with today's technology. We don't need that. But the reason you come is for connection. On a K-Love radio station the other morning, they had a survey that said that the top two things that people are looking for in a church service is authenticity, being real, and connection. What you really want and what I really want is to connect with the other people that come through these doors every week. You want to be identified with a body of believers that worship and serve God. You want to truly know people and be known by others. But deeper than that, you desire people to walk with in the ups and the downs of your life. Listen, this service every week, it's important for us to have a place to worship God, to hear the message of Christ, and to partake in the sacraments together, baptism, uh, the Lord's Supper. But this service is never going to fulfill that desire of connection in you. It's not. It is not designed to do that, okay? You can't truly connect with someone by shaking their hand each week and sitting next to them in silence. You can connect to God that way, but you'll never connect intimately with that person sitting next to you. Do me a favor, okay? This will be out of your comfort zone, but turn to someone right now that you didn't come to, come to church with. Turn to someone, make eye contact with them. Okay, don't look at me. I'm scary. But look at them, wave, wave a little, okay? Wave at them, smile, say hi. Okay, let me ask you a question. As you keep looking, keep looking. It's going to be awkward, okay? But let me ask you a question. 
Don't you want to know that person that you're looking at a little more? Keep looking. Don't look at me. Don't you want to know them a little more? Don't you think that there's a life that you don't know about? Do you think that there's problems in the life of that person that you're looking at at this moment? And they're needing someone just like you to listen to them. Do you think that behind those nervous laughs that you're hearing right now, there's fears, there's worries, there's hurts? The person you are looking at or should be looking at needs to truly connect with someone like you. They need to connect. They don't truly want to talk to you about football. They don't truly want to talk to you about the weather every Sunday before the music starts. They want to talk to you about how they're going to parent your kids or how they're going to parent That'd be weird if they were trying to parent your kids, but how they are going to parent their own kids because the the honest truth is that they are at their wits end. They want to talk to you how to deal with a fellow employee tomorrow morning that they can't get along with, that they are frustrated with. They want to talk to you about how much of a struggle it is to have faith in God sometimes because of all the chaos that's happening in their life. Some of them are losing faith. Guys, we all need connection. God made you in his image. Amen? And and God is a social being, meaning in his very nature that God is triune. He's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He is a little community in and of himself, okay? And he created you to be in community with other people. He designed the church as a body to be interdependent on one another. You are each a part of that body, But none of you and me, by by ourselves, we are not the body. Now, here's something I find interesting about the book of Genesis. Okay, As God is creating the the world and everything in it, he uses the phrase, it is good, six times. Okay, But when he creates the capstone of his creation, when he creates Adam, man, he says something else. He says what? Do you remember? No, no. He says, it is not good for man to be alone. Six times it's good, Adam comes, it is not good for man to be alone. Keep in mind that that when God said this, that his creation is still perfect. There's no sin, there's no death. Man had this perfect, harmonious relationship with God. But God said, it is not good. Now this, this isn't God here realizing that he made a mistake, but it's God displaying to us the priority we have to have on relationships with other people. Every, even with, with man complete and perfect and in complete harmony and fellowship with God, before sin even existed, man needed something else. God in response did what? Created Eve, woman, right? And then God said, as a result of this union, what? It is very good. You have a hole, and this is the truth. You have a hole in your heart that can only be filled by God, but there's also a hole in your heart that God isn't going to fill. That hole is to be filled with meaningful and deep relationships from the people that you see sitting around you. Guys, we need each other. How many people have come through our doors back here uh, or other churches just like this, searching for connection only to walk out feeling worse than they did when they came in here, even after connecting to God? It's because they didn't connect to you. Typically, people who who like a certain church, they're going to attend that church for for some time. Maybe they're excited about it. Maybe they like the pastor. Maybe they like the worship music. They like the singing. Whatever it is, they come for a while. But after that, that romance period has expired because it's going to expire if they don't connect with actual human beings, that sweet thing of a church that they found begins to become sour in their stomachs. If people never move past this church on Sunday morning experience and and they fail to get into into truly meaning relationships with each other, with the church, then people will start going other places and looking for that same connection. They're really not searching for the best worship, for the best pastor, because we have both, obviously. Just kidding, but I don't know. We're great, but they are looking for connection. They want to know others, and they want to be known by others without all the superficial masks. There's a writer uh, that said, 
I have never known anybody who was lonely, isolated, unconnected, and had no deep relationships, yet had a meaningful and joy-filled life. That person doesn't exist. We live our lives around so many people, but do we truly experience life with people on a deep emotional level? It's no wonder that all the time we feel so isolated and we feel so alone all the time. There's a term for that. They call it, they call it crowded loneliness. You're in a crowd, but you're all alone. We have to return to God's original plan and not only do life with God, but we have to truly do life together as well. Look, guys, Jesus thought of this idea of a small group. He, he thought it was so important that he spent the pri primarily the first year and a half of his ministry in a small group, okay? And, and it really continued even until he died. But the first year and a half of Jesus' ministry was primarily Jesus doing life with his 12 disciples. Jesus picked 12 guys and they did life together. They prayed together and they studied the word of God together. If you pay attention to the gospels, you guys will see that, that many of Jesus' teachings are in the context of him uh, teaching and departing deep principles to just his disciples. There's no doubt now that, that Jesus went out and he preached to the masses and he would preach to the multitudes, but there's also no doubt that Jesus poured into 12 men more than he poured into any other person. And, and this is the model from Christ that we have to model in our own lives as well. Because Jesus' model includes prioritizing the, gather, the gathering of the body, okay? What we would call Sunday morning what we call church. But his, his model also included having a group of individuals that he would share life with, that he would bring and take on, and, and he would work on three key relationships with God, with believers, and with un unbelievers. We call these today small groups. In uh, Matthew 4.23, it got really quiet in here, so pay attention. Okay, I think the fan shut off. In Matthew 4.23, Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. He healed every kind of disease and illness. Now, this word synagogue here, this, this Greek word synagogue is, uh, is syna, synagogue, okay? And it literally means to bring together, to gather, or to assemble. So weekly, what Jesus would do is he would, he would travel around, go into these synagogues, and in doing that, he's modeling to us that it is important that we don't forsake the assembly, church. It's important, it has a place, okay? But so often, we stop there. We stop with Jesus' model there. We check the box, and we move on with our lives. We pay no attention to the rest of the, the example that Jesus gave us, me included. Christ had a group of believers that he shared life with. And it was this small group, remember, not the masses that Jesus preached to that went on and would go and change the face of this world. It was this closed, select group that changed the lives of millions and millions of people to come. And it's because Jesus' small group that the message of the gospel has trickled into the 21st century, has trickled into your ears, into your heart, and has brought you here this morning. So it's really the disciples' fault that you had to get five kids ready to church bring them through the doors this morning, scramble to get here. It's really all their fault, so blame them. But look, guys, we have a vision for this church. We have a vision, and, and this vision goes much, much past seeing each other every Sunday morning. And I want to share that vision with you in, in the second half of this message. And, and look, this isn't going to be your typical sermon, okay? Um, and I ask for your forgiveness of that, where, where we pick a passage, we talk about its meaning, and we apply it to our lives. Um, but this is more of an exhortation for us as a church to return to this model of Jesus' life. We got we to gotta move past where we are and into the model of Christ. The Bible says that where there is no vision, I'm supposed to do the magic trick where... Boom, nothing. Okay, I'll read it here. Where there is no vision, the people perish. So we're completely in line with Scripture this morning uh, in sharing that vision with the people because this vision includes modeling what we do after the life of Christ. We want to return to that model. So we're going to talk Lifehouse, 
with the understanding that all we do uh, this morning is helping us to fulfill our church's mission statement, which is based on the word of God of maximizing your soul, your spirit, and your body so you can influence the world. Amen? All right, so in our current Lifehouse structure, okay, we have corporate services on Sundays and Wednesdays, and we have what we call life groups. We've got the corporate thing down. We really do. We all assemble most faithfully just as Christ modeled in his own life. Okay, we got this down. Here's proof right here today. And this is something that that we we don't want to diminish or put a dim light on because this should be a priority in our lives. Hebrews 10.25. It says, And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near we got to continue to assemble. But we also got to recognize at Lifehouse that our current life groups, what we call our current small groups, uh, aren't creating the type of connection that Christ had with his disciples. It's just, they're just not. Groups like our marriage classes, men's groups, pairs and spares, guys, they're, they're succeeding in discipleship, just as Pastor Brett said, teaching others how to be more and more like Christ in their life, but they are failing to truly connect us to each other. Okay, here's the common scenario. You got loud in here again, so it's okay. It's a common scenario. Okay, you go to pairs and spares. If you're in your 20s or your 30s, you go to pairs and spares. You bowl or you do whatever activity that we're doing that day. Um, you talk about weather. You talk about football. You go home. Okay, you talked. Maybe you connected a little bit. Once in a while, there's a, there's a true connection that's made there, but that was that. Okay, people are encouraged, they had fun, but no true, deep relationship was formed. Our marriage groups, uh, and we really have some excellent teachers who teach these, these groups, they're amazing. But the typical practice is to show up at the marriage group, hear the information, answer the questions, maybe talk to another couple for a few minutes, and then after the session, you return home. You go back to your house. When the six-week or eight-week study is over, it's over. Nobody truly connected with each other. No deep connection was made. Those couples now, they they go away with new skills to apply to their marriage. They may have been influenced by another couple, and those are good things, but the bond between couples in that group really hasn't gotten any closer, if we're going to be completely honest. We had to get real honest about a lot of the things that we do here at Lifehouse Church. Now, here's how you can look at relationships in this church, okay? And there's three types of relationships that exist that I want you to see, and we can use the analogy of a house to explain them. Given given that this is called Lifehouse Church, it's pretty fitting, right? So the very first part, uh, bring up the porch, okay? When you're at at your house, okay, the porch is a place where you do business, right? The porch is the place where creepy people come that you hide from when you don't want to be seen, right? Pastor Brett comes to my porch all the time, like, close the window. I don't want, I'm just kidding. I only did that once. (laughs) But that is the place of business. That is the place where you greet each other. You say hi. You say, no, I don't want your your oven cleaner or whatever you're selling me. Go away, okay? The, uh, The porch at Lifehouse Church, if we apply that to Lifehouse Church, is our weekly worship service right now. It's Wednesday worship service. It's the time where... We, we come and we shake each other's hand and say, hey, how's it going? You're good? Good. It's kind of like Groundhog's Day sometimes. It really is. You say hi to the same people, you shake their hand the same way, and, and you go about your business. That's the porch. That's today. The next one is, I got to fast forward in my notes. Boom. The living room. The living room. The living room at your home, that's a place for guests to, to start getting to know you, Right? That's where you start figuring people out. That's where you're going to start talking about football and weather. Uh, That's a place where you have those initial connections with each other. When you come to Lifehouse Church, we have a lot of of living room settings. We do. Uh, Our current life groups, those are living room settings. Our 4th of July event uh, with Ninja Warrior, really a, a, a living room group. The things that we do, our current life groups, everything, it's that's where we're getting. We're, we're talking a little life, but you're really just kind of at that superficial level, okay? The next one, and, and the most important one, where we want to go is the kitchen table, okay? The kitchen table at your house is where families come and eat together. The place where guests that were once in the living room become part of the family. 
This is where the world's business, at least uh, in many families, this is where the world's business is, is dealt with, right? Dad, ask each kid how they're doing. You figure out the world at that time. The kitchen table at Lifehouse Church is very minuscule, if we're to be completely honest. <coughs> sometimes we have these sporadic, deep relationships, kind of between long-term members, uh, sometimes between staff, but really, we don't have too much connection happening at the kitchen table level. So what we got to do is we got to create kitchen table atmosphere here at Lifehouse Church, and we believe that that can be done, and it is going about, it's by going about small groups in a different way. That's how it's going to be done, and we believe that that can be done in, in forming a ministry that we're calling or referring to as home groups, okay, and that's what we're going to be talking about. We believe that that will take uh, the kitchen table, and that will take the vision of making us more like Christ and the, and the example that he gave us, it will bring it to completion. But our current life groups, if we're going to evaluate our current life groups, they're succeeding at times and connecting to people like we said, but they're not forming those true and deep com communities that we want that's often experienced by people at these kitchen tables. Beyond that, our current format makes the staff, primarily the senior pastor, responsible for the care of every individual within this room. Every individual within the church looks to the pastor as the main guy to go to when they need care. Do you see the problem there? Okay, listen, it's, it's impossible for one pastor to truly connect and share life with 200 plus people. It's impossible. It's not that the desire is not there in the heart, but it is just not a physical possibility. Remember Moses in scripture? Moses had thousands and thousands of people that he was trying to care for. Finally, Jethro, his father-in-law, steps in and says, you need to appoint some leaders to spread the burden out. You know, you, I know you have the desire to, to care for all these people, but put these people in place and you only take care of the big stuff. Jesus, remember, he had masses and masses of people seeking him for healing and for care, but Jesus concentrated the majority of his efforts on a select, closed group of 12 disciples. These 12 and really 11 would go on to change the face of the earth. But under our current format of small groups, we're reliant on the same core leaders to facilitate life groups. We don't really have a reproduction of new leaders. Current groups are short-lived, and they're hard to raise up new leaders for. Guys, we have to change what we are doing if we want to truly connect with each other. we got to model our lives after Christ. So what we're proposing is, again, a new way to do small groups in a way that we're calling home groups. We believe that with these new groups that I'm going to explain more about in a minute, uh, they'll usher people from the porch of our church into the kitchen table, onto the kitchen table. We believe that the people themselves inside of these groups will, will begin to care for each other wholeheartedly and the responsibility for care will shift from the, the pastor to the entire church themselves. These new home groups will immediately utilize people with the spiritual gifts of leadership, with hospitality, compassion, mercy, teaching, you name it. You ever wonder why God gave you spiritual gifts? Well, if you are in one of these groups, if you join this home group, you will see your spiritual gifts come out. They'll be relied on. They will be needed to make that group a group. But these, these new home groups will continually reproduce new leaders because the group leader is going to actively be training another leader as they're doing these groups. These new groups will re replicate themselves. They'll create authentic community, and they'll grow uh, the participants. Every person that joins those groups, they'll grow you spiritually. That sounds good, right? Sounds fantastic, but how do you get it done? And said simply, we return to the model of Christ when we do these home groups. We do them the way that he did. Now let me give you a working definition, okay, of home groups. A home group is a closed group of four to six couples or eight to ten separate individuals who meet together once a week for a period of 12 months for the purpose of having fellowship with one another and I don't even like that word fellowship. You just hang out and do life with each other, okay? Study the, the Bible together. I don't even like the word study. Just read the Bible together, learn to be Christians through the word of God, and pray together. We can stick with pray. I like that. <laughs> but now the key word that you see here is the key difference between what we're already doing and what we want to do is this word closed. 
closed, okay? When these groups are formed and the initial members are added, they become closed to anyone joining after that point, unless a vote is taken and every member of that group agrees to let someone else in, okay? And now I'm probably like you. When I first saw that, I said, yeah, that's a sure way to make a bunch of clicks in the church, right? A little, a little scary there, but here's the thing, okay? Having a closed group will actually create just the opposite of a click. When groups are closed, people get real with each other. People start building relationships with each other, and they start trusting each other. We stop talking about football statistics. We stop talking about weather patterns, and we start talking about real life. This trust and this camaraderie is only going to happen in a small group. How do we know? Because we don't have it in any other group that we offer. And remember, guys, we are basing this idea off of what Jesus modeled in his own life. Jesus had a select, closed group of 12 people that he poured himself into. Started with 12 disciples, ended with 12 disciples. Closed groups create togetherness. They create a unique bond only experienced by the groups themselves. When we, when we open groups like we do now with our current life groups, people are being discipled, no doubt. Okay? They're being discipled, but no one is opening up about who they truly are or what is truly bothering them. We might give them kind of a glimpse. We might open a page, but we don't really open ourselves up all the way, do we? The reason we do that is because we don't know who's going to be in that room from week to week. It's not safe. We haven't created a safe environment for you to really open up. Okay? I don't know about you guys, but my life is not perfect. I know that that probably comes as a shock to you. I know it does. But, and my wife is probably most surprised about that statement. My life is not perfect. Okay? But I have, I'm kidding, but my, I have struggles that I got to talk about. I do, but I'm really calculated about who I share those struggles with. Okay? You don't have to tell everybody, and that's okay. I share my soul with the people that I love and trust. I talk about football and weather patterns with people that I'm just starting to get to know or, or people I only know on a superficial level. Closed groups are going to create that bond that we all are looking for, that reason that drives you through these church doors every Sunday. Now, I said that these groups would, uh, they would create, or they won't create cliques. These, these groups aren't going to create cliques, and here's why, okay? The small group is together once a week for a year. Okay? But this group has an expiration limit from the very get-go. When these small groups form, they also plan to split into two groups before they ever get going. It's a prerequisite to these groups. During that year that they're together, the leader of that group will identify one potential person to lead the next group. And at the end of that year, that, that, that group will go two ways. Okay? And they will form two groups. What, what, when that happens... Half the group forms over here and half of them over here. And then the original group, what they'll do is they'll keep their original connection to each other. You're never going to lose that. Actually, last night, my wife and I from our old church, we went out with two couples that were in an old group of ours, a closed group. And we had just as good a time. It's like we never missed a beat. We were together. We were fellowshipping. We were talking about true life. Okay? You're going to keep those relationships. It's been two years since we saw those. So those are never going to change. But as you go into your second or your third or your fourth group, you're going to keep those relationships and you're going to build one with him and her and her and him and, and that guy over there. It's going to, after time, bring this entire church into unity with one another. We're not creating cliques. Actually, it is the anti-click. Cliques diminish because people are always forming new relationships with other people. Now, it's a little scary, and I'll grant you that when we think about being with the same people for a year, once a week. A little scary. What if you find yourself in a group with a person or a couple that you just can't get along with? Okay? What, what if you don't mesh with the people that you've been matched up with? And that happens, right? Okay, I know I'm a really good guy. I know. I know I'm handsome. I know I have a lot of talents. I know I am full of it right now. Okay? But you know what? There are a lot of people that don't get me, and they would rather do anything else than be locked in a room with me for an hour. I'm waiting for my wife to say amen to that. Amen. <laughs> amen. 
But when we launch these groups, we're going to have what we call a try it before you buy it period. Okay, you know how they do with cars? Same principle with the group. Every group will intentionally get together. They'll meet once a week at a time that that group determines that works for everybody for a simple eight-week period. Eight weeks. Simple. On the eighth week that that group meets together, each couple or individual will decide if they want to stay in that group or if they want to move on. They want to try another group, per se. Of the couples that decide to stay, you'll sign an agreement together saying that you'll stay together and continue meeting together for the 10-month period that, that'll round out that year. In that 10 months, that new leader's being trained, uh, and you're going to be going over an array of issues. Really, you're going you're to cater whatever you're talking about to the needs of that group. So every person in this church is going to be reached at the level or at the place in life that they are at. We're going to talk about real life. They'll do life together, and we'll start getting past all that superficial stuff. You guys want to get past the superficiality? I know I do. Again, at the base of this, our goal is to move people into these groups so they can grow in those three key relationships. Beyond that, when, we, when, when these groups meet, we'll encourage them to break from their study uh, once every six weeks and go out into the community and serve. Go out and serve. Easy ways you can do that. Go to Crossroads. Okay? Uh, make somebody a meal. Adopt one of the families that we are ministering to on Fifth Street. Find a house. Make them meals. Get to know them. We want you serving together. When we form these groups, we'll put people together who are in the same season of life together. So typically we'll have a group of of young marrieds, okay? Young singles, uh, singled married, or seasoned marrieds, and seasoned, it's hard to say, singles. Notice how I didn't use the word old, okay? Because that is bad and you get, that is naughty. But we, (laughs) we want you sharing Bonds with people who are at the same stage of life with you. That's really what we want. And now one of the major concerns for people, especially in my age, is, is child care. Okay, sounds great. What are we going to do with our kids, right? We don't have the money or the finances or really the want to take our kids to a babysitter again that evening or one evening a week. And legit, right? Trust me, I know. I don't want to do that either. But if we're truly going to stand here in church every time a child is dedicated to God and we take an oath as that church, that we are going to aid in growing this child up, we're going to aid in being a part of their lives, then we truly got to follow through with that promise. All right? We take a vow before God every time a kid comes up here and, and gets dedicated. Now, now, here's the thing. If you have kids, take them to the home group with you. Do life together. Embrace the chaos, right? If the kids are old enough, they can entertain themselves in another room or go outside They can do it, right? And not only will our relationships as adults grow with each other, they'll become stronger, but if our kids are around each other all the time, what do you think it's going to do to our kids? They're going to grow together. We're actually, as adults, going to start making relationships with our friends as kids because we're around them all the time. If the kids of a group are too young to be, say, left by themselves, then we perhaps delegate a couple a week. If there's five couples, you take one week, you go to another room with all the kids. Okay, I would do that once every fifth, sixth week if that meant getting to grow with people, getting to get past that superficiality, yeah. right? And uh, <laughs> he said, amen, preach it. <laughs> but really, if you have kids, just bring them. Let them run around, man. We're going to do life together. Don't you do that when you come to family for Christmas and everything else? You do life. You figure it out. You do it together. And guys, that's what's really at the heart of this. We got to connect and we got to be intentional about it, okay? It's not happening by showing up here on Sunday morning, shaking someone's hand, sitting next to them silently and walking out the door. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever go out with another individual or a couple and you really thoroughly enjoy your time together and, and then at the end of the night you say goodbye and hey, maybe if... Maybe if the stars and the sun and all the planets align just right and we can all get babysitters, we'll do it again next month, right? I don't know about you, but I always walk away saying, I wish I had more with those people. I wish I knew that couple a little better. I wish, I wish that we could just do life with them because here's the truth. I need people in my life to lean on when things get bad. I do. Uh, we hang out with uh, Luke and Karina Cleaver. Is your husband in here? 
It's even better if he's not, but, oh, hi, there he is. Yeah, we hang out with them uh, mostly out of force and mostly out of coercion from my wife to do so. I'm just kidding. But Kelsey and I walk away every time together uh, saying, you know, I, I just wish we could see them all the time. I wish we could do life with them. And really, we only say that about Karina, not really about Luke. So, <laughs> sorry, Luke. But guys, small groups like this are the answer to that problem that I know that you have. Whether you're single or married or young or old, I mean seasoned, excuse me, uh, we all have this desire for true, intimate friendships. We do. You're building the image of God. That's how we made you. We want these groups to be a way of life for you. We don't want them to just be another program that you check off the list every week. Now, as we're, we're getting toward the end here, okay, one of the final objections to groups like this is when people say that, I don't, I don't have time. I just don't have time. My life is busy. I can't devote one night a week to being in a small group. And you see, that is exactly why you got to get into a group like this, okay? Because the truth is, you are not supposed to have so many things in your life that it takes away from building relationships with other godly people. You are not. If I'm not mistaken, guys, it seems like the busyness in your life is a scheme of someone trying to prevent you from concentrating on what truly is important to the heart of God. The devil loves how busy you are. He loves it. If he can keep you separated from the body of believers, then you cannot grow as a Christian. You can't make an impact on the kingdom of God. You can't organize. You can't go on the offensive against the enemy. We want you in a group sharing life together with other believers so that when trials in your life come and when they rear their ugly head and you know they will, that you have a built-in support system when those bad things happen. You're going to have earthquakes in your life, right? You're going to have financial earthquakes. You're going to have health, health earthquakes, emotional earthquakes, relational, career. You're going to have real earthquakes that devastate all your property. When those tough times come along in life and you don't have a spiritual family to support you, you're going to collapse. But if you're having your first child and you're in a group, the people in your group are preparing to have that child with you. They'll be there to celebrate with you, to pray with you. If you lose a loved one, your group will be there to console you with that burden. If you lose a job, you'll have people around you to help you and hold you up in that time of need. Church, we got to be in a home group because that is when the church becomes the church. But sometimes our initial reaction is, we don't got time for this. We don't got time for this. If we don't have time to do the very thing that God has put us in the world to do, then what are we doing? We don't have time for, to form true relationships with people that are going to make our lives better and the way that God designed us? Do we, do we really truly evaluate the things that we put into our life? Do we really truly evaluate if those things have any eternal value or if they're just momentary fleeting pleasures? Guys, I watched a three-hour football game yesterday, and I'm going to forget it two seasons from now. I'm going to remember it because it burnt my face really bad for a little while. But other than that, it had really no effect on my life. It didn't. And, and I love when I can catch the newest episode of a TV show like America's Got Talent, right? But I completely forget about it days later. I think I watched every single episode of that show last, week, uh, last year, and I can't even tell you who the winner was. I have no idea. And the reason is because those things don't really matter. But the things I never forget is the people that I have loved and the people that have loved me. I'll never forget my brothers that I spent a year overseas with in Iraq. I never, I'll never forget that passion that we felt for each other, that camaraderie. And that's really what this whole Christian thing is like. This whole life is being involved and, and living in an active war, okay? Didn't God declare war on Satan when he said to him, because you have done this, talking about when Satan deceived Adam and Eve. He said, cursed are you above all livestock and wild animals. He said, as Christ, he said about the Christ later to come that he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Didn't God declare war on Satan 
when he sent Jesus Christ, it's like God said, enough, you are done binding my people. I'm sending a savior to bear the sins so you cannot keep them in bondage. And guys, aren't we so often passive about this battle that we're, that we're in? We're passive. We have to put up our defenses, but we also got to go on the offensive against God, amen? Or excuse me, against Satan. That is the guy we want to go on the offensive against. I don't know about you, but I am tired of being run over by the devil. I'm tired. There's a pastor, uh, John Piper, he says this. He says, I hear so many Christians murmuring about their imperfections and their failures and their addictions and their shortcomings, but I see so little war. Murmur, murmur, murmur. What am, why am I this way? Make war, right? Our lives are a spiritual battle. We are in a war. When I was deployed to Iraq in 07, I didn't go over there alone, right? I went with an entire company of heavily armed and trained soldiers. I wouldn't have lasted 20 minutes by myself, right? I would have got hungry. I would have walked into Baghdad looking for a snack. I would have died. But I need every soldier in my platoon to do their job every time we rolled out of the gate of our base to protect each other and the convoy that we were securing. But before we ever rolled out of that gate, before we ever went on that mission, we had to have a uniform battle plan to react to the threats that we would face. Roadside bombs, car bombs, uh, ambushes, small arms fire, those were our daily reality. Without that battle plan, without that team, I would have easily died. And guys, we need the very same thing in our war against Satan. We need fellow soldiers to do battle with, and we got to have a battle plan. How many of you have a sin that you cannot get rid of? How many of you go to your grave again and again because your sin leads you astray? Your sin leads you to addiction. Your sin leads you to failure. You cannot gain victory on your own, and you know you can't because you've tried. You need the power of Christ in your life, but you need intimate relationships with other Christian comrades to help you gain the victories in the areas of your life that you are weak. You need a platoon of fellow soldiers around you. You need a home group. You need a group and you need a battle plan. You need to be committed to this group of soldiers and do life together to fight those spiritual battles by praying with each other and by going over God's uh, uh, marching orders of scripture together. Guys, it's time that we go on the offensive against Satan and we stop sitting here in defeat. I'm tired of being scorned. I am tired of being held down. I am tired of being beaten. Remember, the armor of God, the armor of God has both defensive and offensive weapons. It's time that we take up our swords and we make war against Satan, amen? It's time to unashamedly preach Christ. It's time we come together as a church and we organize. It's time that we stop murmuring and we make war. Our weapons aren't bullets and guns, but, but we wield the sword of the Spirit. Our ammunition is love. Our main offensive weapon is serving others and doing what is right. We got to get together. Your battle buddies are waiting to be made in a home group. Your battle plan is doing life together. If this church coordinates, if we assimilate into separate battle uh, groups every week, we come together at the beginning of every Sunday to worship and do, do church together and worship God, then we are going to be a primary weapon in the hand of God. God will use us. But if we fail to do this moving forward, nothing's going to change. We'll see each other on Sunday. We'll sing. We'll listen to God's word. We'll go home. Right? We'll stay stuck in our habitual sins. We'll long for the power to overcome them. We'll keep longing for true relationships. We'll hang out with each other once in a while when we can all get babysitters. And, and we'll continue knowing that there should be something more between us. We'll continue living our lives in the presence of one another, but not truly knowing each other deeply. Let me close by saying that we're moving forward as we speak into integrating these home groups really into the DNA of the church. We have approached some people uh, even this morning that we think that you're going to make excellent leaders of these groups. And we'll need many more of you to consider leading these groups as, as we get them launched. And, and if there's some uncertainty 
about your ability right now to be able to lead these groups, so let me break it down for you Barney style, okay? Leading a group is super simple for you to do. It truly is. It's so simple. Even if you've never led a group, you can do it. Four things that you need to do that, you, that are required of you, and it's the acronym HOST. You got to have a heart. You got to be able to open your home, serve a snack, and turn on the TV. Simple. If you can do these four things, you can lead a small group. You will be trained before you ever get going, and everything that you go through as a group is going to be explained to you beforehand, and we're going to make it so simple on you. We're going to make it easy. We just need people who are willing to step up. We need people who are sick of the status quo and are willing to step up and be a part of something bigger, be a part of something that matters for eternity. If we've uh, approached you as a possible leader this morning, uh, sign up for our luncheon when you walk out. Walk out the back door. There's a list. Sign up for our luncheon. This lunch, uh, it's going to answer further questions that you've got. It's not a commitment to become a leader just yet, but it's a commitment to go to the lunch and hear the pitch, okay? To hear, to hear the idea. Uh, besides leaders, guys, we also need you, church. We need you to get into a group, okay? We need you to consider this. We're simply asking that you get involved in each other's lives. Uh, we want you to connect to each other. We want you to be a church. We'd never ask for, for you to do anything that we ourselves as leaders wouldn't do. That's why 100% of LifeHouse's staff will be attached or running one of these groups themselves. Guys, we want each one of you to be loved and to be able to love other people that you see around you. On your way out, you guys too will also have an opportunity to, to sign up for one of these groups. Um, as we get them going, as we get them launched, as we get leadership figured out, we'll give you a call, we'll attach you to a group, and we'll get the process started. And I promise you, as a final thought, these relationships are going to change your life. They're going to change your life because these groups, they're not just another program, okay? But they are people loving people and growing in their relationship with Christ together. Amen? All right, hey, let's stand up and pray. Father God, uh, I just thank you for really... Uh, just tearing us raw, Lord, and, and just helping us get real about what we are doing as a church, God. We want to serve and love you. And God, I believe that we have done that, but God, if we have failed at, at connecting as a body, I just pray repentance right now. God, if you've pointed out in, in your word that it's just as important to get together with one another, have those vital relationships that, as it is to worship you, Lord, but we put you above all. And we want to fulfill this plan. We want to fulfill the, the model of Christ that he gave us in his own life. Lord, I just pray for connection through, for this body, God. I just pray for people to meet the needs of other people. God, if not us, then who? Lord, we trust you. I thank you for this spirit that you've given us. I thank you for already opening our eyes to this, bringing the scales off of them and opening us up to these ideas. And Father, I just pray that now we can step up and be the church, that now we can step up and, and really compassionately love each other, help each other out, lay our belongings at each other's feet and just do life together. In that, God, we glorify you and we fulfill the purposes of the church when we do this. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we pray in Jesus' name, amen.